Hear the word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 61 and 62. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch." The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Peace be with you. Good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas again to you all. As we come to the end of the year, we are capping our sermon series in the prophetic books with prophetic hints of the promised Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. And today we have come to the book of Isaiah. Let's begin this way. In, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, Jesus visits his hometown synagogue on the Sabbath. And he begins to read from our sermon passage today. Isaiah 61 and 62. And he says this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And then he claims to be the fulfillment of that scripture. He says today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus claims to be the anointed one. He, the word he uses is Messiah. So in Luke 4, Jesus, Jesus gives us a very important interpretive key when it comes to understanding Isaiah 61 and 62. Because according to Jesus, these chapters are about him. These chapters are about him. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him because the Lord had anointed him to proclaim good news to the poor. Our passage this morning begins at the end of chapter 61, and the anointed one, the Messiah, is speaking. Jesus is speaking. Beginning in verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Now, there are... There's so many metaphors that play in these verses. Clothing and garments, headdresses and jewels, the priesthood, marriage, gardening, light and darkness, righteousness and flowers and bloom and, and so on. But the passage does seem to oscillate between two primary metaphors. The metaphor of marriage and the metaphor of gardening. In the Bible, these metaphors are actually very, very closely related. Marriage and gardening, if you'll consider these. In the garden, Adam watched as the serpent deceived his bride. In the Song of Solomon, the bride is often described as a garden. In the Gospel of John, Mary Magdalene, who symbolizes the bride of Christ, meets with Jesus in a garden, and incidentally, she this takes him for a gardener. In Revelation 21, the holy city of God is described as a bride adorned for her husband, but the city is simultaneously described as a garden. 
Now, there's more where that came from, but I, I think we get the point. The Bible routinely mixes the metaphors of marriage and gardening. Wives are depicted as gardens, and husbands are depicted as gardeners. Gardens are beautiful and fragrant. Gardeners are not usually so. (laughs) Gardens are, by nature, charged with glory and potential. Gardeners, on the other hand, they're most glorified when their gardens are glorious. And so husbands are called to care for their wives, to love their wives like faithful gardeners, because wives, like gardens, have the God-given potential for great glory and fruitfulness. The best gardeners are those who know and love and tend to and guard and care for their gardens with attentiveness and diligence. Truly, in these, these verses, there really is an entire marriage sermon, but let's move, let's keep moving forward. Let's read verses 10 and 11 again. And I want you to notice again, just these, the, the, the garden and marriage metaphors. In fact, Rick, don't put, this, don't put the, the scripture on the screen. I just want you to hear this and visualize it. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. So, Here we see the anointed one rejoicing because God has clothed him with the garments of salvation and righteousness. Verse 10, however, is very strange if we give any thought to it. The Messiah describes himself as both a bridegroom and a bride. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So it's a good question to ask. Is is the Messiah being compared to a bridegroom or a bride? Is Jesus a bridegroom or a bride? We'll wait to answer that later because we need to get to some other strange things before we settle that. But we do see that the Messiah is adorned, is dressed with salvation and righteousness like a bridegroom and like a bride. And the result, the the result of this, the result of the Messiah being dressed with salvation and righteousness is that the garden of God bears the fruit of righteousness and praise. And all the nations are going to see it. And this theme continues in chapter 62, verse 1. Let's read. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. <clears throat> so notice here that Zion, the city of God, is referred to as a she. Jerusalem, the city of God, is a woman. Also notice that the garden of chapter 61 is now a city in chapter 62. And when she, the city of God, is glorious, when she shines, the nations will see her glory. Like a faithful gardener, the Lord will tend to his garden, his bride, also known as Zion, also known as Jerusalem. And under his tending, she is going to be beautiful to such a degree that the nations will be drawn to her glory and to her fruitfulness. 
In other words, she's going to turn some heads. Verse 3. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. So again, we see Isaiah is continuing to mix metaphors. The garden, which is the bride, which is the city of God, is a crown of beauty, a royal diadem, a a shining tiara. She is no longer forsaken or desolate. She is stunningly beautiful, cherished, spoken for, married, and made exceedingly fruitful. And under the Lord's care, she has a new name, my delight is in her. God is depicted here as the as the ideal bridegroom. So consider for a moment a wedding ceremony. We've had a number of them here. I know a number of you have been to weddings before. Picture that for a moment. A glor- a, a a groom is is glorious in his own way but he's not preoccupied with putting his glory on display. What he really wants is for everyone to see the glory of his bride. As a gardener, the groom is most glorified when the garden, his bride, is revealed in all her glory. And that's the dynamic that's at play here in Isaiah 62. This is how God relates to his bride. Now, I know, well, maybe you're thinking, um, I know what the church is like, and she is not all that beautiful or glorious. And there may be some truth to that, but it doesn't mean that Isaiah is wrong. It just means that the church isn't currently living up to the Bible's vision for her, but Even so, when a garden is struggling to bear fruit, even when a garden is choked out by thorns and thistles, a good gardener is able to see its underlying glory and potential. A good gardener can bring life back to a garden seemingly too far gone. And so this is... This is terribly important to remember. And so, no matter what age we live in, no matter what time we live in, the church is never God forsaken. She will never be abandoned by her great gardener. She is adored. She is valuable. She is held in the highest esteem. She is called, my delight is in her. And she will be cultivated and made fruitful. And if the God of creation delights in her and is committed to her care in this way, perhaps we should be too. Now, let's remember, again, that from chapter 61, that the the Messiah is compared to both a bridegroom and a bride. That's that's Jesus, is compared to both a bridegroom and a bride. And that's, that's strange. But as I promised earlier, things are going to get more strange. Chapter 62, verse 5. For as a young man marries a young woman, that's the word for virgin. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So there are two problems here. One, one in the first part of that verse and one in the second. Two strange problems. The first problem is that Isaiah says that multiple sons will marry their virgin mother. How can a virgin be a mother to a plurality of sons? 
why would Isaiah depict these sons marrying her? The second problem is that Isaiah says that God is the husband of that same woman. The virgin mother will be married by her sons and married by God. Again, very strange. And not just for us. I mean, Isaiah's original audience would have found this very strange as well. But I, before we twirl too much in that, I want us to remember Luke 4 again. Jesus has already invited us to interpret these verses, these things as pertaining to him. So how does the gospel help us make sense of these very strange problems? Well, let's begin with the virgin mother. The most obvious fulfillment of this theme of a, of a virgin mother is in the person of Mary. In the New Testament, not only is Mary the mother of God, but she also routinely ser serves as a symbol for the church, the bride of God. You see, Mary represents and symbolizes God's people throughout history. Throughout the Old Testament, the people of God were anything but virginal. They were routinely unfaithful. They were routinely adulterous. But by the time we come to the New Testament, God has, in essence, restored the virginity of his people as symbolized by the Virgin Mary. And that's how the mother of God is simultaneously the bride of God. Jesus is the son of God, but he's also the son of Israel. He is the singular representative of all God's people. And catch this, all the sons of God are in the Son. And he, Jesus, in whom all the sons of God dwell, has come to be a bridegroom to those people, to marry God's people. To be a bridegroom to the bride, the very people who gave birth to him. This is how many sons in the Son marry the bride. Now, that is still a bit strange and confusing. I know. But it most certainly is deserving of our reflection. It's deserving of our meditation, looking at this scripture, discussing it amongst our parishes with other brothers and sisters, being like the psalmist in Psalm 1, meditating upon his word day and night. We should keep chewing on this. But make no mistake amidst that, make no mistake, do not miss this, Jesus has fulfilled Isaiah in the most incredible way. But what about problem number two? How can the Son of God be married to the same virgin as God himself? Well, this one is actually a bit easier because the Son of God is God himself. Jesus is the son who becomes a bridegroom to his mother because he is Yahweh. Yahweh has taken on flesh. Yahweh has come as a son of Zion in order to become the husband of Zion. Now, as you might expect, there's a lot of debate among scholars about who is speaking in these verses. Is it, is it God? Is it the Messiah? Is it the people of God? And, and the answer is yes. God, the Messiah, and his people in covenantal union with one another. In the words of the Apostle Paul from Ephesians 5, this mystery, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and his church. In other words, the profound mystery of the union of God and his people is a varied and layered and multi-metaphored union. The Messiah and his people, the son and his mother, the bridegroom and his bride, they have become one flesh. We are united to Christ as in a marriage. And this mystery... This union is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. 
So as Christians, as, as those who have seen the fulfillment of all these things in the Messiah, we have the distinct privilege of perceiving how all of this strangeness, how all of these mixed metaphors actually find their fulfillment in the person of Jesus. And most certainly, we are also given a powerful picture of God's specific and holy love for his church. God's glorious esteem and his expressed intentions for us, his beloved. What are, what are God's intentions with us? He tells us right here. A number of, a number of years ago, my sister began dating a man who would eventually become her husband. And before my dad died, this young man was able to express to my dad his intentions with my sister. That what kind of, what kind of man he was going to be. How lovely he found my sister. What kind of life he wanted to build with her. I, I never found out what he said. My dad didn't tell us, but I wonder, if, I wonder if we could imagine, in light of these scriptures, I wonder if we could imagine him saying this. I'm, I'm going to love her to such a degree that life is going to spring forth from every part of who she is. Everything I have will be hers and she will be mine, and I will have no other. Like a good gardener, I will tend to her, I will protect her, I will care for her until every row of her is blooming with fruit and flower. I'll take joy in her every day of her life. I'll be so good and so faithful to her that she will become good and faithful. And everyone is going to see her and be drawn to her beauty and glory and righteousness. And I will call her my joy, my delight, my beloved. It seems that I'm mixing metaphors too, but I think that's appropriate. But we don't have to imagine such intentions, Sojourn. Our bridegroom speaks them to us. So hear this, dear brothers and sisters of Christ. As the bride of Christ, we are prized and cherished. We are the Lord's joy. We are a beautiful and beautifully adorned bride. We are a crown on the head of Christ. We are the glorious garden of God. And we could, you know what, we could even be more specific. You. Individually, you, Britt, Matt, Ashley, Peyton, Chris, Nick, Randy, you are God's delight. Children of Sojourn, give me your, give me your eyes for a minute. I want you to remember this. As long as you live, when you wonder who you are, you wonder what you are. You can say this. God delights in me. You're not perfect. You're not sinless. But that doesn't stop him from delighting in you. You are deeply loved. And this love, this holy love isn't just merely kind. It's transforming it's consuming. It's stronger than death. And the God who tends you is the God who intends and desires to see you fruitful. And he has promised his diligence and attentiveness to make you so. Through his word, by his spirit, among his people, and with his righteousness and salvation. He can see glory in you that you cannot see in yourselves. So take courage and joy. Sojourn, 
You are loved and being looked after by a good and faithful gardener, a good and faithful husband. And that means that you are destined for glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for your great love for us, for your promises to keep us and to not forsake us, for giving us a new name that is your delight, for betrothing yourself to us as a faithful husband, for tending to us as a faithful gardener with a steady hand and heart, for promising to rejoice over us and make our glory as bright as the noonday sun. We thank you for your Son in whom all these promises are possible and binding. Help us as a people to avail ourselves to your word, your love, your pruning, your correction, your encouragement. And we pray that you would bring the nations into your glorious light, into your church, so that they might join the song of your worship. We ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.